Have you ever wondered how early explorers transported plants? Well, we're going to visit one of Christopher Columbus's ships, a beautiful replica. It all starts in 30 seconds. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to the show. Man, am I excited about the topics today. We're going to take a look at one of Christopher Columbus's ships, the Nina. It was the smallest of his exploratory vessels. Now, this is a beautiful replica. You're going to really enjoy seeing it. And we're going to connect that to some of these citrus trees, which played a very important role to his crew as they came to the New World. And since this is fall, I thought we'd take off through the Ozark Mountains and learn a little bit about tree planting in today's show. Now, for those of you who have become regular viewers, you've no doubt heard me talk about one of my latest projects. That's the Garden Home Retreat. You see, this is an environmentally friendly house and garden located in a rural part of the county where I live. The goal here is to go green, to look for as many products and solutions that are good for the earth. Also today, we'll find out about the adventures of an English botanist who passed by this spot long, long ago and how his travels inspired a book about the Arkansas Territory. From soaring vistas to sailing ships on the sea, the story of the Nina and exploring early America coming up. If you're like me, you have an interest in where your foods come from. Well, if you also have an interest in history, you know it goes way back and it started on a vessel just like this. Well, Morgan, the Nina is quite a vessel. Well, thank you, she's a great ship. We've been sailing her for about 14 years. And when Columbus and his crew uh, set sail, uh, they really had no, they, they were thinking they were going to India, or didn't they? They were going for the spices in the Far East. Um, there's some debate whether Columbus knew that Brazil existed. They thought he, maybe he'd had an unauthorized voyage and found Brazil. These voyages over, were, were they were no party. This was tough going. It was extremely hard going for them. They only had livestock on board. And that ran out. Uh, 40 people on board usually at one time. Uh, when they got to the New World, the Indian tribes gave them uh, vitamin C necessary for uh, conquering scurvy. So that would have been in the form of vegetables uh, known to the New World, uh, tomatoes and onions, and squash and pumpkins and potatoes and tomatoes, all these things that uh, we just take for granted. The Europeans to that point had never seen these things before. I mean, even turkeys. I mean, it opened up uh, the palate in, in the old world and uh, it was very important. The Nina's mission is educational. Uh, for the last 14 years, she's been sailing to over 600 ports. We do uh, a lot of schools and teachers come on board, uh, about a million in total so far. And then we've had about a million to two million uh, families and individuals tour. She tours about 50 weeks of the year. You always sail with the Spanish flag and the American flag. Well, she's a Brazilian boat uh, built in Brazil, and so we're, we're a dual flag. When we're outside the United States, we fly the Brazilian flag, and we're also registered in the United States. You know, if sailors in the 15th century only knew what we know today, they would have known to carry some lemons along with them to keep that scurvy away. You know, what's interesting about these citrus trees is this time of year, I start bringing them in along with all my other house plants, but I try to avoid any hitchhikers. If they've been out in the garden all summer long, you better check on the underside of the leaves to see if you've got any little friends there. And what I like to use is an insecticidal soap or some safe insecticide that you can spray and bring into the house. That's what I'm doing here and making sure it's completely drenched to get rid of things like mealybug, scale, and aphids. Now, I love this Myers lemon. I started it from a little tree that I ordered from a nursery in California. These are so delicious. But what I've done is I've had to bump it up two or three times into larger pots. And what I like to use is a really good potting soil, one that's blended for container gardening. You see, you get lots of extras. You get a soil that will actually drain well you get plenty of nutrients, and you also get a little water-retentive polymer that will help keep the soil consistently moist. 
which is not going to do anything but help you and your plant. Now, the thing to do is not to go out in the backyard and dig up soil. That's no way to save money. Start with a good potting soil. And I do this with all of my house plants, whether they're fruit bearing like this Myers lemon or not. While we're on the subject of lemons, which can add flavor to so many dishes, just get a load of this recipe, details later. But first, strap on your hiking boots and we're going to explore the Ozark Mountains. And a little later, the adventures of Thomas Nuttall. I have to say fall is one of my favorite times of year. It really is magical. As we watch trees go from rich greens to golden browns, yellows, oranges, and burgundy reds, it's just spectacular. If you've ever had a chance to explore the natural world in autumn, you know that every turn in the road, every bend around a mountain trail can open your eyes to amazing sights. I grew up in Middle Tennessee, up on the Cumberland Plateau. This is where this footage was shot. Glorious, isn't it? Now to get great color like this, conditions have to be just right. You see, you need good rainfall. You need bright, cool days and nights that hover just above freezing. But what happens when you're a top tourist destination in the middle of an autumn with less than spectacular colors? Well, we spoke with Claudia Vecchio, the Branson Area Chamber of Commerce about this. Well, certainly fall colors are a real reason why people travel during the fall. They love to see the color in the trees. But really, every single destination is sort of beholden to Mother Nature to make that happen for them. So uh, certainly in the Branson Lakes area, it's not going to be a deterrent at all for tourism. Uh, certainly the Ozarks, as you can look around and see the Ozarks, they're beautiful any time of the year. There are years that fall colors are, are very much dependent on the natural evolution of things and how the colors change. So there have definitely been uh, years like this in the past where the colors have just gone from green to brown or really haven't have done much in the way of their beautiful color changes. Okay, so you want to plant some trees of your own to get beautiful fall color. Great idea. Well, a wonderful place to visit is a tree farm. I stopped in and talked to Jerry Blankenship of Little Creek Nursery about the process of digging trees and how it's changed over the years. Jerry, you guys have a lot going on up here this time of year. Well, we sure do. We're getting into the harvest season and uh, the, our biggest problem has been we hadn't had enough rain. Yeah, well, it does and affect being able to dig these trees, doesn't it? That's right. It, uh, it really slows the process down. We have to, to ring around the tree and, and water in to allow our diggers, our machine diggers, to get into the, uh, to the earth to, to pull the tree out. Jerry, the way these trees are dug from the field, loaded and hauled away, has changed tremendously over the past 50 years. We used to have hand diggers, and that's uh, people would come and uh, use a simple spade to, to dig the tree out, and it may take, uh, you know, up to 45 minutes to get a good-sized tree out of the ground, and now we use, uh, you know, a bobcat with a tree spade on it, and uh, we can literally have a tree uh, dug in probably about 30 seconds. It may take another two or three minutes to get the, the burlap and the, the wire basket and whatnot put on, but, you know, a process that used to take 20 minutes, you know, can now take, you know, less than two or three. Now, the critical thing, of course, in digging a tree is to, to try not to um, loosen the ball or loosen the roots from the, from the tree. What sorts of precautions do you all use in the industry to keep that from happening? Well, we use a, a, a polypropylene twine that we, uh, you know, we tie the root ball up with that keeps it good and tight. On their smaller plants and on the larger plants, we might use a sisal twine, which is three-ply, and we really tighten up the ball to, to keep it tight. Right. And, and that's the main thing, and we, we try not not to, to let the ball get wet when we're uh, loading it on a truck because then it'll get loose in the ball and uh, you might not have success with a tree that uh, where the ball's been Sure, been you tear those roots away from the soil. Now on larger trees, you actually set the, the root ball into a wire basket. That's correct. And we do that, that, that helps to keep it tight. It cinch, we cinch it up and, uh, and that keeps the, the, the ball good and tight and firm. The great tasting recipe you won't want to miss, plus a connection to an English botanist and my garden. The story after the break. Before the break, let's take a look at one more plant for bringing color into the garden. Now this little nemesia is not new. It's one called Bluebird. It's been around a while, but it's worth mentioning because it's still one of the best you can grow. Although it can stand up to heat better than some, the quality that I rely on is frost tolerance, so it's ideal for the early spring garden. 
Bluebird has a snapdragon shaped blue to purple flower that mixes beautifully with other cool season favorites such as violas, ornamental kale, and pansies. If you know me, you know I love history. And I was delighted when a friend of mine told me that Thomas Nuttall, an early English botanist, passed right by the farm in the first quarter of the 19th century when he explored and documented the Arkansas and Red Rivers. That journey was just before Nuttall became the curator of the botanical gardens at Harvard and wrote a book about the Arkansas Territory. We caught up with Dr. Trey Berry, an expert in Arkansas history, to learn more about Nuttall's famous trek. One of the more influential, and probably one of the earliest uh, naturalists that come into this area of what becomes uh, the United States in 1818 is Thomas Nuttall. Uh, he really is someone that's just absolutely passionate about taking samples and categorizing what's here, uh, showing the world what's here. He, he really gets fascinated with that as a youth, and he takes that on into here, and he's the, really the consummate eccentric. And some of his expeditions uh, in the area, uh, his party who travels with him says they are always trying to find him because he's getting lost and he has to go out and find him because he's so wrapped up in his work. He's one of the few of the naturalists that really come here and draw pictures. Uh, most of them will come and they will tell stories, write uh, stories in the journal, uh, take scientific readings, but Nuttall's one of the few of these early natural historians that come here that actually document it through artwork. And you can see that in some still, they still exist. Some of the mountain ranges, some of the uh, landscapes that he's drawn, uh, really give us uh, one of the first early looks of what Arkansas looked like and this region looked like. He describes uh, Pinnacle Mountain being about a thousand feet high and he's almost exactly right, it's about a thousand ten feet high uh, above sea level, so he was pretty close to that. One of the things I don't think we all appreciate is that these early scientists, these early botanists, these early ornithologists that come into this region, we owe them a great deal of gratitude because had they not come into this early, early era of this land, we wouldn't know probably every animal species that was here. We wouldn't know what all these vast forests and plant life looked like. This is the garden of Master Gardener Mary Lynn Tilly during the winter, and I want you to listen for just a second. Hear that? That's water. Even in the cold, bleak winter, Mary Lynn's garden is alive with the energy of rolling water. Now, roll over into late spring and take a look at this. Delightful ferns and mosses play against the rocks, and the water just keeps on rolling down. What a perfect compliment to this woodland setting. I've lived here 30 years with my husband. We had our two children here. Um, I started gardening seriously about 15 years ago. I am a master gardener. I've been a master gardener for about seven years. I'm currently president of the Pulaski County Master Gardeners. So I've planted maybe 20, 25 trees. Uh, we've redone some things that we did when we first moved in. My interests have changed. I've gone from loving native plants to liking ornamentals. Uh, I still am interested in trees. I love bulbs. Um, I love shrubs. Um, I like my garden to have a four season interest, so I try to go that direction whenever I can. My husband helps me a lot. When we first moved here and we had small children, he gardened. He, he tended the yard, as he would say. He mowed and, and um, planted. As we both have gotten into gardening, uh, he has gone past digging holes for me to having opinion. I try not to worry over something that fails. I try not to look at it as a failure. I try to think, okay, this is a new experience for me. Move on, find something else. And because gardening, I mean, it's that same old thing of life is short, enjoy your garden and do whatever it takes to enjoy your garden. From a well-stocked woodland garden to a stuffed red snapper, stay tuned because we've got a delicious recipe with Chef Eric Isaac up next. Welcome back. Count on my friend Chef Eric Isaac to show us a truly outstanding recipe for stuffed red snapper that you can put together with elements from your own garden. 
Hi folks, today we're going to be baking a whole red snapper with common vegetables and herbs that anyone can grow in their garden. Now this fish has already been cleaned and scaled for us, but we're going to begin by removing these outer fins. You don't want them to poke through the aluminum foil. You're going to want a good seal on that while you're, while you're steaming it. Now, we're going to begin by seasoning the fish with olive oil, coat it inside and out. Make sure you get in that cavity there. Coat the whole fish. And then season inside and out. Salt and pepper. This side. And a little pepper inside. Then we'll begin with the uh, citrus. We'll take the lemon, your limes, and your oranges inside. Be sure to leave the rind on these citrus. It's gonna add a lot of flavor. Add your herbs, your thyme, and your rosemary is what I find go best with this fish. Now you wanna start with your garden vegetables. We have carrots, some celery, onions, and garlic. And those can go right over the top of the fish. There we go. And then we're gonna add a little butter also. Put that right over the fish. This butter is going to melt and it's going to blend with this white wine and the juices from the fish. It's going to steam it once it's in the oven. But you do want to season it again. Just make sure any that was washed off stays on. Salt, pepper, and drizzle the rest of the olive oil over the top. We'll wrap this up in the aluminum foil. Make sure you have a nice seal on that. No fins are sticking out, no punctures and it's ready for the oven. Now this is only gonna take about an hour at 400 degrees. That's what I love about this recipe. It's so easy, the heat does all the work. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. You know, I love making connections in history to plants. We saw one very important explorer, Christopher Columbus and his connections to plants in the New World, and then one not so well known, Thomas Nuttall and his exploration of the Arkansas Territory. Now, if you'd like any information from today's show, including that delicious recipe, just check out my website, pallensmith.com. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. garden I dream of a bed of flowers bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us and every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile oh no, I can't help but smile.